All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. Uh, my name is Natalia. I'm with Illinois Indiana Sea Grant and I'm the main facilitator of the Invasive Crayfish Collaborative. For those of you who aren't familiar with the ICC, um, it's a program that brings together a variety of experts and stakeholders to address the threat of invasive crayfish in the Great Lakes. We create monthly newsletters about um, uh, recent crayfish literature and news host webinars like this one about new crayfish research and programs. We also work and collaborate with other organizations and help promote responsible crayfish practices in general. Um, and so before we begin, I, as usual, will quickly share a list of different links that you can follow if you're interested in learning more about the ICC. You can check out our main website, invasivecrayfish.org, which acts as a one-stop shop for invasive crayfish information and, and is always being updated with new information. If you want to join the ICC membership, you can follow the join link to find our subscription form and uh, you'll be subscribing to our monthly newsletters and we'll receive notifications about our upcoming webinars, meetings, and other events. And if you're interested in registering for future webinars or viewing past webinars, uh, you can follow these last two links. And then finally, you can email me at chicago.illinois.edu if you have any questions or comments. And I believe we're adding those links to the chat so you guys can easily access them. Um, so one of the goals of the ICC is to make new information regarding invasive crayfish more accessible, which in turn will make people more informed um, and enable them to make better decisions about invasive crayfish management. However, while our organization is named the Invasive Crayfish Collaborative, we believe it's essential to underscore the work uh, and the effort being made to help protect and conserve native crayfish species as well. And that's what today's webinar uh, highlights. So today we have Dr. Caitlin Bloomer from the Illinois Natural History Survey, who will discuss topics regarding conservation land management for native burrowing species in Illinois. She will also discuss considerations for distributional modeling and also talk about her development of the American Crayfish Atlas. And for those of you who don't know Caitlin, she is a postdoctoral researcher with the Illinois Natural History Survey and serves as the acting curator of the INHS Crustacean Collection. Uh, she examines the ecology, management, and biogeographic patterns of North American burrowing crayfish using ecological niche models, isotopic diet studies, and field experiments. Her research informs the distributions and conservation management strategies for these cryptic burrowing crayfish while aiming to understand what led to their evol evolution of a semi-terrestrial lifestyle. Uh, she recently completed her PhD in Natural Resources and Environmental Sciences at the University of Illinois and worked in Dr. Chris Taylor's lab. Um, other fun facts about Caitlin, she's originally from Ireland and moved to the U.S. for grad school. She completed her undergrad degree in marine biology at the University of St. Andrew, a, excuse me, at the University of St. Andrews on the coast of Scotland. But after conducting a few different research projects, she decided that freshwater research was much more interesting. <laughs> and I have to agree with you there, Caitlin. Thank you so much for being here. So to everyone joining us today, we encourage you to type in any questions you may have in the Q&A box or in the chat at any point during the presentation, and then we'll eventually go through them after the presentation. Also, as a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and it'll eventually be posted on the ICC website with captions. Okay, um, so with that, Caitlin, you can go ahead and share your screen. Perfect, thank you. All right, looking good. Uh, the notes section are short. Oh, there we go. Perfect. All right, thank you so much for that introduction. As Natalia said, my name is Caitlin. I'm currently a postdoctoral fellow at the Illinois Natural History Survey, where I conduct crayfish research. I'm also a postdoctoral fellow with the Institute for Genomic Biology, where I develop and teach classes for the Master's of Science in Journalism degree. So that is what I'm up to right now. I'm going to present a little bit of my doctoral work that I defended a few months ago, discussing the management and conservation of native burrowing crayfish and how that might apply to the species we have here in Illinois. So I'm based here at the INHS uh, Crustacean Collection, which has over 135,000 lots of over 400 species. It's this really incredible resource that the survey has that's able to provide publicly available data for species across Illinois, which make up about 50% of the collection, but North America as a whole. It specifically has a crayfish collection that's incredibly impressive and is second in size only to the Smithsonian. So when I first moved to the Natural History Survey for my doctoral degree, 
Uh, it was an obvious choice to start doing something with all of this incredible data at my fingertips. And we also happened to coincide with a pandemic, which meant all of Illinois shut down and we were stuck at home. So one of the first projects I worked on was developing the American Crayfish Atlas. This was a resource where myself and Dr. Christopher Taylor wanted to provide all the data that's available through INHS and other institutes more visually for the public. So it took about two years to develop and way more coding than I ever thought I would do when I signed up to an ecology degree. But altogether, we moved outside of INHS and collated data from 56 different sources. We had collaborators from 28 museums, seven state agencies, and a handful of papers that we also dredged data from. And altogether, for the 420 crayfish taxa in the United States, we collected over 44,000 records that are now presented on our website. So by, able, by being able to visually present this kind of data, it really highlights things like the high biodiversity that you see of crayfish in the southeastern United States, similar to the diversity patterns you see from gastropods or mussels. And that diversity reduces as we move out west, we hit dispersal barriers, and by the time we hit the western United States, we're in a different crayfish family altogether. It can also be really useful for highlighting where conservation efforts are needed. So this is a map of the burrowing crayfish that I work on uh, across the United States, and it really highlights areas that survey efforts are required to gather more distributional data. Similarly, it can highlight areas where survey efforts are required for taxonomic clarity. This is a map of the devil crayfish complex, which was once thought to be one species with an incredibly wide range, and since has been split into seven or eight new newly described species. Uh, the original devil crayfish is limited to east of the Mississippi, mostly on the Atlantic slope. So now we have all these historic records that were labeled Lacunicam baris diogenes, or the devil crayfish, and they need re-identified. Taxonomic efforts need to be directed to these areas with a lot of historic records. So where we have species like that, you'll notice on our species drop-down list, that will be labeled uh, a complex. There's a couple different benefits you can get out of this American Crayfish Atlas. I've got an image here of Illinois, and you can see it's pretty densely covered with historic records. You can tell that there's a natural history survey in this state that spent over 100 years collecting these records. And whenever we're able to visually identify the ranges and the distributions of our species, that can really support conservation assessments. When you're considering if a species needs to be considered threatened or endangered, looking at their distribution and ranges is one of the first things that an evaluator will examine. Beyond that, um, looking at the taxonomic identifications, I just mentioned the devil crayfish complexity. Uh, it can it can be difficult to keep up with all these newly described species, the changes to the genera within crayfish. If you're not just buried in the, this literature every day, it's very easy to get overwhelmed in it. So having taxonomic experts that look at these historic records, make sure that everything's being kept up to date is really important for providing those detailed records. Uh, of course, things like over-harvesting for the pet trade is always a concern when it comes to crayfish. So we do have federally endangered species on this map at a broad scale, but as you zoom in, you'll find that those localities actually disappear off the map and we're not directing anyone to habitats of species that we are con concerned for or are federally endangered. So this is just a quick overview of developing and kind of the benefits of this atlas. It was a really fun project to work on, and it's useful for things like conservation assessments and supporting scientists. But one of the biggest values it has is providing detailed records for the public. Crayfish are not always considered, although I disagree, not always considered charismatic species. They don't get as much attention as the megafauna you'll see on television. So being able to engage with the public and have them interested in what species they might find in the creek behind their house is a really great way to bring more conservation attention to these species that can be overlooked. So that's a really quick overview of the Atlas. It's now been online for a couple of years. I'm not going to dive too much further into it, but if you are interested, the website is available and you can go look and see what might be near your house. I'll move along a little bit to talk about my research. So I work on burrowing crayfish and their biogeographical patterns. I'm particularly interested in things that drive habitat suitability for these species, in their habitats, how they're utilizing the resources available to them, and how we can manage for their conservation. 
a really quick bit of background just because none of the or most of the invasive species that you'll work with will be stream or lake dwelling species. Burrowing crayfish are kind of a subset of crayfish that, like the name suggests, create burrows. Um, and they're mostly accepted to fall into two groups. There are primary burrowing crayfish, which create these deep and complex burrows. They can have multiple tunnels, multiple chambers, and they dig the whole way down to the groundwater. So while they are considered freshwater aquatic species, they rely on that groundwater for moisture rather than moving into permanent water bodies. And they will spend most of their life underground in these burrows. You can see the picture on the bottom right I have is of a crayfish burrow and all the mud pellets that have been pushed up above. And that is pretty much the only way you're able to detect if a crayfish is in the area. The other group is known as secondary burrowers. These can develop or create um, simple or complex burrows. They could be a single tunnel and chamber into the ground, or they could be more similar to primary burrowing crayfish and have multiple tunnels and chambers. The big way that we differentiate these two groups is that our secondary burrowing crayfish are connected to permanent water bodies, and they will more regularly move into these water bodies to find mates or food. Now, if we're looking at the conservation status of burrowing crayfish, there are currently no federal, federally listed burrowers. Although there are several species being considered for listing under the US Fish and Wildlife Service's seven-year working plan. If we look at a different metric for conservation status, the IUCN red list has 20% of burrowing crayfish listed as data deficient, and a further 13% haven't even been evaluated yet. So there's this big disparity in the species that we think are data deficient, several species that are held at a state level as threatened or endangered, and the actual federal protections being provided for these species. One of the big reasons for that is that to list a species under the Endangered Species Act, one of the characters you have to provide evidence of is loss of habitat or range. And one of the major knowledge gaps we have when it comes to burrowing crayfish is distributional data for them. Without that data, it can be very difficult to prove these species are threatened or endangered. One of the reasons, or several of the reasons we have uh, a lack of distributional data for these species is, as I mentioned, they're incredibly cryptic. They can be difficult to detect. And therefore, whenever you're doing surveys for them, it can be hard to confirm your, what species or if there is a species there. And they are notoriously difficult to sample for. These species require you to physically dig them out of the ground if you want to get your hands on an individual. There have been several studies trying to find better ways of sampling for burrowing crayfish, and repeatedly it is coming out that physically digging them out the ground has the highest success rate. However, even once you've found a active burrow that you're pretty sure there's a crayfish inside, success rates of getting that crayfish out still only range from 15 to 30 percent, so notoriously difficult to sample for. And when you do sample for them, all sorts of horrible things happen to your arms and hands. So there are not very many researchers focusing on burrowing crayfish as a group, not very many people willing to go out and sample for them. Although several of the people that are willing to go out and sample for them are on this call, so nice to see your names pop up. So when we're looking at those burrowing crayfish distributions, you can see they follow a similar pattern to crayfish overall, high biodiversity in the southeast, tapering off into the west and up north. Here in Illinois, we have got seven species of burrowing crayfish currently known. Down the left, we have our prairie crayfish, our digger crayfish, and our vernal crayfish. And then this group over on the right of four that I have are all species that are closely related to that devil crayfish within that complex. We've got our Crawzilla crawdad on our paint-handed mud bug up top. And down bottom, we have got our Great Plains mud bug and our war paint mud bug. And you can see that these species all look pretty similar. So they've been causing us all sorts of fun adventures here in the crustacean collection, trying to identify what is still living in Illinois and where. So when we're looking at this lack of distributional data that is so key for informing conservation status, ecology, and evolution, it can make it really difficult for us to know how we manage for these species. So I'm gonna walk through some of my doctoral studies here, two studies that examine local scale distributional drivers, and then a, a slightly larger study looking at distributional modeling for burrowing crayfish. Starting us off with understanding local distributions. 
So what I examined was how land management could act as a local distributional driver. Land management practices have been common in agriculture and conservation for centuries. We have been managing lands for centuries, which are influencing what species we find on those lands. However, very few times are we actually looking at how those species are responding to the land management practices. Current land management plans are designed to support ecosystem function, restoration, and conserve taxa, but a lot of the time those management plans are for specific taxa. So the work that I conducted was funded by the Missouri Department of Conservation and was based in Missouri, but the species I was working with are also here in Illinois. And I've got some examples on the on the slides of the kind of conservation management plans that you would see, but you can see they're targeting birds, they're targeting white-tailed deer, there are very few, if any, management plans available that are actually trying to promote or conserve burrowing crayfish. So my aim was to examine, do the land management practices on the conservation areas affect the presence or density of burrowing crayfish species that we're interested in? So we selected two types of conservation areas. We had a couple down in the southeast Missouri that were considered wetlands where we examined mechanical vegetation disturbance. We were looking at disking and mowing as land management practices and comparing it to unmanaged areas of conservation. Uh, and then up north in Missouri, we had a prairie conservation area where they had rotational prescribed burns and they were also installing fishless ponds that are benefiting amphibians for breeding habitat. Starting off with our wetlands study, so we had our three management types, our disking, our mowing, and our unmanaged areas, and we laid 22 transects across each of the management types. Along those transects, we were measuring uh, variables at the quadrat level that we thought might be influencing the presence or density of burrowing crayfish. We looked at things like canopy cover, soil texture, stem density, and the presence of sedges, which are a plant that indicates soil moisture. I'm not diving too deep for the sake of this presentation into the statistics that I used to analyze this data, but I ran generalized linear mixed effects models using my two wetland conservation areas as a random effect to account for spatial co correlation. And we ranked those models by AIC corrected for small sample size, because of course crayfish are very difficult to get your hands on. Here's an example of what some of our areas looked like. On the left, you can see our mode area. It's got successive woody vegetation coming in along the edges, but along these trails, you can see the vegetation's low and maintained. On conservation areas in Missouri, they generally will mow these areas twice a year to maintain them. Looking in the middle, we've got our disked area. It looks very similar. Again, you can see the succession to the back of the photo, but up front, it's got that low maintained vegetation and the soil texture is a little different. You can see it's been turned over. On conservation areas, they normally disk once a year and it's a little shallower disking than you'd see for agricultural practices. Uh, and over here on the right, Generally in the Mississippi floodplain, unmanaged areas present as bottomland forests. So you're getting moist soils, but you're also getting a lot of canopy cover as that woody dense vegetation grows up. When we were sampling in our wetlands, what we found was mostly Creaserhinus photians, the digger crayfish. This is a species found in Illinois, and though it's not considered for any protection here, in Missouri, it is considered a species of greatest conservation concern. So it was exciting that we found it. And we didn't find any effect of this mechanical disturbance on the vegetation. Now, if you look over here at the graph I'm presenting on the right, you can see our disc and mode areas are our first two slots and the density of burrows is higher. It's, it's quite clear that the unmanaged area on the right has lower density of burrows. However, this wasn't a significant difference. The, the burrowing crayfish weren't responding directly to the management practice. Rather, they were responding to the subsequent vegetation that came from the management practice. It's been noted in a few different species that there is higher burrow densities in areas of low canopy cover, although the reason for that isn't entirely certain. So these areas where the land management is coming in and halting succession and disturbing the vegetation, those are maintaining moist soil, open canopy areas that seem to be preferred by the burrowing crayfish. Therefore, although the species wasn't benefiting directly from the land management, it was benefiting from the consequences of that land management. If you're interested in reading a little bit more, that study is published in Environmental Conservation. Moving over to our prairie, we had three prairie sites. One had been burned the year we sampled, one burned the year before, and one burned two years before. 
So we placed 50 quadrats randomly in each of those sites. And then we repeated that sampling process the following year when a new site had been burned. We measured our quadrat variables, things like distance to a natural stream that was found around the perimeter of the property, distance to those artificial ponds that were installed for the amphibians, soil carbon and elevation. And again, similar to our wetlands, we used the generalized linear mixed effect models, and then we used burned sites as a random effect, this time again ranking by AICC. Here's an example of what our sites looked like. On the left, you can see two years post burn, those warm season grasses have grown up really thick and dense. We've got dense vegetation and pretty difficult to sample in. Compared to on the right, we have two weeks post burn where those cool season green grasses have recolonized the area really fast after a burn, but overall it's pretty easy to sample. And because of the differences in these kind of areas, we had to be really careful with our quadrats. On the left, sampling in one of the sites that hadn't been burned for a while, you can see those warm season grasses really just cover up your entire quadrat. So we had to be careful to completely remove the grasses out, get on our hands and knees and search and make sure that our detections were uh, equal across our different sampling sites. So what we found in our prairies were Procramberus gracilis, the prairie crayfish, which doesn't seem that surprising. And we didn't find an effect of the burning regime. Their presence and densities were roughly similar across all three types of burn sites. What we did find our crayfish responding to was slightly higher elevation. Now this was a relatively small prairie site that we were sampling in. So when I'm saying slightly higher elevation, the elevational change across our site was under a meter. We used LIDAR data so we could get finer scale elevational data, and they, we did find a significant response to it. We also found a significant response to proximity to the artificial fish ponds, which was interesting because they didn't show a response to the natural stream, but they were responding to these artificial ponds. Now, if we look at the graph here, the left bar shows uh, non-detections of burrows, and the right bar shows detections of burrows as we're moving further away from the fish ponds. And you can see as we're further away from the fish ponds, we're getting a lot of non-detections. As we're far away from the fish ponds, there are still quadrats where we found burrow detections, but as we move closer to the fish ponds, almost every single one of our quadrats had a burrow detection in it. So essentially, while these burrow, while these crayfish don't need fish ponds or fishless ponds to have suitable habitat, they are benefiting from them. They do seem to show somewhat of a preference. And when we're thinking about these two things together, these proximity to the ponds and this slightly higher elevation, what we kind of put together as a biological explanation for this is that our species do benefit from soil moisture. They want moist soils, they want shallower groundwater, but they don't want their burrows to be inundated with water. They don't want to be flooded because that reduces the oxygen levels available to them in their burrows. So by having proximity to the artificial ponds while maintaining burrows on slightly higher elevation, they can benefit from kind of the best of both worlds, have this Goldilocks situation going on where the soil moisture is just right. So again, the species wasn't responding to prescribed burns, but it was still benefiting from pond installation as a land management practice. Summarizing these, uh, these projects here, and I've got a little video just to keep the people entertained. Our burrowing crayfish were benefiting from the land management on conservation properties, even though they were not target taxa. These kind of management practices are benefiting waterfowl. They're brought on the land for quail or hepatofauna or small mammals. Burrowing crayfish are never one of the target organisms for Missouri's uh, management plans. However, if we maintain these moist soil open canopy areas and install fishless ponds, these are really easy management practices to promote burrowing crayfish. If we keep working with other species, looking at other management practices, we can figure out what benefits and promotes burrowing crayfish on the land. And currently, since they are already benefiting from current management practices, it seems pretty easy to integrate burrowing crayfish into management plans for other taxa. Now, when we're looking at Illinois, as I mentioned, there's no species of burrowing crayfish considered uh, of greatest conservation need here in Illinois. However, there are several species like Massasagas or Graham's crayfish snakes that rely on crayfish burrows for habitat and overwintering. So when we're looking at promoting populations of burrowing crayfish on the landscape, although they are not of greatest conservation need in Illinois, it has much wider conservation implications. And these kind of management plans could consider integrating burrowing crayfish to benefit several other species. All right, changing gears just a little bit. 
we're going to look at a broader scale of modeling distributions. Ecological niche models are known as a pretty popular tool for modeling distributions. They might also, you might also have heard them termed species distribution models or habitat suitability models. These kind of models are a predictive machine learning form that's able to correlate presence data that we find here in the INHS crustacean collection with environmental data. And they can correlate those two things to predict suitable habitats to sample for your species of interest. These models are able to project to new areas that don't have known distributions, and they're also able to project to future or historic climate conditions, so we can estimate the dispersal and changes in distributions of our species. When I use ecological niche models, I generally use Maxent or a maximum entropy modeling method, which has been proven to be good with small sample sizes and can use presence-only data that you find in museums. So. When we're using these kind of models, as I keep mentioning, the problem for burrowing crayfish is this paucity of distributional data. It hinders our conservation assessments, it provides difficulty when we're directing our surveys, and it can make it difficult to build these kinds of models. The solution that we looked at uh, during this project, we're trying a few different types of models. We built models for each of our single species that are pictured here, as well as try to use these species to be surrogates for each other. Species with similar niche niches might exhibit similar habitat suitability and therefore could act as surrogates. So that's what we were examining with our three species that had purportedly similar habitat. They all shared burrowing behavior. They're all classified as primary burrowing crayfish and they all have areas of sympatry in their ranges. When we put our three species on a map, this is roughly the range they encompass. They are all pretty widespread and considered common crayfish. Uh, and overall, we were using a study extent of about 18 states. Up north, we've got the X's representing Procambrus gracilis, our prairie crayfish. We've got the gray boxes representing the digger crayfish, Griserinus photians. And then down south, we have Lacunicambarus ludovicianus, or the painted devil crayfish. And in the background, I think this was precipitation as an example of the kind of environmental layers that we were using. So first aim was, can these three species be distributional surrogates? However, even though that map I've shown you seems to have pretty widespread, somewhat common crayfish distributions, our species still have relatively small numbers of historic records. By the time we collated all the historic data we could for these species, we had between 0.2 to 0.6 historic records for every 10,000 square kilometers of their range. So that's still extremely sparse data available. Our solution to try and, tar uh, to try and get around this was to combine all three of our species records and create this super specific distribution model or a model above the species level. So our second aim was to create this super specific model and see if we could use it to find primary burrowing crayfish. When you're developing these models, you have to be pretty deliberate about the environmental variables that you select. So we selected variables that had either had a confirmed tie or we suspected to be pretty influential when it comes to habitat suitability for burrowing crayfish. Things like depth of the water table, land cover, elevation and soil moisture, as well as uh, average annual temperatures and precipitation, both average annual and seasonal precipitation. So when we built these models, this is kind of what they looked like. Uh, you've got the black dots represent the historical records. And whenever we're looking at our map outputs, dark blue represents low habitat suitability, moving up through those warm colors into high habitat suitability. And you can see the models do congregate high habitat suitability around areas that have historic distributions. But several of our models were also suggesting high habitat suitability in areas that didn't have historic distributions. And that's where you'd start directing those new surveys. So in order to test if it, the model's predictions were right, we ground truthed our models in Missouri, where our three species have overlapping ranges. The black dots represent sites that we sampled with no detections for any burrowing crayfish, and then the white dots represent successful detection sites for our target species or on the far right for any burrowing crayfish. We found all three of our target species, and we also found 11 sites that had other species, I consider them non-targets, that our model wasn't trained to find, other burrowing crayfish species. And overall, we sampled 98 sites across Missouri. So looking at AIM-1, could these, distributional, could these species act as distributional surrogates? Whenever we're looking at their response to the environmental variables that we selected, 
you can see that they had very similar responses. Pictured here are our three species responding to elevational changes, and they all had somewhat of a negative relationship to increasing elevation. However, our digger crayfish on the left had a preference for elevation below 150 meters. Our prairie crayfish in the middle had a preference for elevation between 100 to 250 meters. And our painted devil crayfish on the right had a preference for elevation below 100 meters. So those are similar responses. They are overlapping, but overall, they did have differences in their response to the environmental variation, to the environmental variables, and they had differences in their habitat preferences. Looking at their response to maximum annual temperature, you can see our two northern species on the left had a negative relationship with annual temperature, whereas our southern crayfish on the right had a positive relationship. So overall, looking at our first aim of if our three species could act as surrogates for each other, they did have specific habitat requirements. When we were ground truthing our models, we found that the surrogate models were not predicting distributions as well as our single species models. When you're looking for a target, one target crayfish, a single species model seemed to be the way to go. However, our second aim was looking at that supraspecific model above the species level, all of them combined to see if we could find primary burrowing crayfish. Whenever we look at the response of all the primary burrowing crayfish to the environmental variables, what our model was predicting is suitable habitat for primary burrowing crayfish as a group. And what it predicted are very or conditions that uh, primary bur or that burrowing crayfish biologists would consider suitable habitat. Things like shallow water table, low elevation, relatively low maximum annual temperatures. These are things that people look at and already agree that sounds like suitable habitat for a burrowing crayfish. And whenever we looked at the species that we were targeting, the detection sites that we found for our three species or for burrowing crayfish as a group were largely predicted to be in these areas predicted by our model to be suitable. So looking at our second aim, could the supper specific model predict the presence of burrowing crayfish? Absolutely. It was successful at detecting them across Missouri. We found several sites that were new to the state of Missouri that we did not know burrowing crayfish lived there. And we also found several species that we weren't deliberately targeting or training our model to find. So overall, this was considered a pretty successful performance from our model. And there's a few different reasons why this kind of model could be really useful. Supper specific models can direct surveys in areas that have few historic records. Again, looking back at this map of the burrowing crayfish distributions across the United States, you'll find that these black circles I've highlighted have burrowing crayfish records all around the edges of them, but very few within the black circles. And whether those are areas of unsuitable habitat, which is unlikely for such a large area, or more likely these are just areas that have had less historic survey efforts conducted in them, um, a, a super specific model is going to be able to help us direct those surveys, reduce the resources, time and effort required to find those burrowing crayfish, and overall help us uh, figure out what is there and what is suitable habitat within those sites. A second uh, reason that this can be really useful type of model is where there's taxonomic confusion. So where a species is lacking historic records. I mentioned that Lacuna cambaris, the devil crayfish complex earlier, if you look at just Illinois, it's completely covered with historic records for the devil crayfish. We have 534 lots here in the Natural History Survey collection, just of devil crayfish that haven't been re-identified yet. And yet there are about four other four newer, four newer described species that this is more likely to be. So whenever we don't know exactly what species we should be modeling, we're not able to build those single species models Supper specific models are going to be really useful for directing our surveys in those areas and allowing us to continue surveying the landscape without having to go back to every single site and get enough data to build single species models. So summarizing this work, where one species of interest is being targeted, single species models do seem to be the way forward for predicting their distributions. However, where you're working in an area or with a species that lack those historic records, our multi-species models are definitely showing promise for directing surveys to broadly suitable burrowing crayfish habitat. And this work is currently in prep, so should be being published hopefully within the next year. Summarizing the whole talk today, I've thrown a lot at you. So the American Crayfish Atlas is available to explore what species are near you and examine the distributions that you might find for your crayfish. 
The land management practices can benefit burrowing crayfish in wetlands and prairies, and we should be promoting crayfish burrows on the landscape as it has broader implications for conservation than just our species that we're interested in. And evaluating the ecological context of distribution models can inform the best type of model to use. So there are multiple kinds of distribution model you can be using, and we're starting to get closer to the answer of which situation is best to use each model in. A quick thank you to everyone who funded this work and supported it, especially Missouri Department of Conservation that fund a lot of the field work and my graduate studentship. And thank you to my advisor and doctoral committee who helped get me through all of this work, as well as the over 40 field volunteers we had helped go out and catch these burrowing crayfish. They are a lot of effort to catch, so it takes a lot of people to get these kind of data sets. And with that, I'll take any questions. Great, thank you so much, Caitlin. Uh, we have a question in the chat. Are there any plans to incorporate a researcher tier for the Crayfish Atlas that allows researchers and state agencies to access the historic records information in a more detailed manner? Sure, so some of the data that we got for the Crayfish Atlas are from the Illinois Natural History Survey collections, which are already publicly available on the INHS website. You can download coordinates, you can download locality descriptions, because there's more detailed data available. Some of it is from the Smithsonian, which is also publicly available. Other um, other data sets that we received were from personal collections of researchers across the country. So some of that data is probably still going to be kept private, especially records of federally endangered species. Um, but a lot of it is already publicly available. In terms of the first part of the question was incorporating a researcher here. Um, I, I don't think there are any plans for like having a full-time person take care of the Atlas, although it feels like a full-time job. So... Uh, I don't know, stay tuned. <laughs> that could be a great idea in the future. <laughs> um, and for everyone who uh, doesn't know, Katie added the um, uh, website to the chat. So you can check that out right there. Yay, um, thank you. Also, yeah. I like just all capitals, yes, in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, lots of support. Um, can you talk a little bit about the relationship between crayfish burrow densities and food availability, considering how managed lands with mechanical disturbance might enhance the nutrient cycling and, and support crayfish compared to unmanaged lands? Um, I can try. So <laughs> the question of Sorry. what do burrowing crayfish eat is still pretty much in the air. There are a very small number of stable isotope studies that are have been done or are underway attempting to figure out exactly what their food preferences are and what exactly they're eating. Um, in terms of Crayfish themselves, or burrowing crayfish, are already very useful for turning over the soil, pulling leach nutrients up to the surface. They already do a lot of that uh, soil turnover themselves. So I don't think that things like disking would provide more food. However, I think that using things like disking and mowing to promote crayfish provides crayfish as food for other species in those ecosystems. So they are definitely an important part of the food web, but I don't think the practices are providing more food for them. Got it, thank you. Um, how does competition with other species in unmanaged lands affect crayfish in terms of burrowing locations? And how does managed land with mechanical dis disturbance potentially mitigate that competition? Sure, that's a really interesting question that I don't have a great answer to, because whenever we were looking at um, mechanical disturbance, we found one species. And whether that is because that is a species that benefits from it more than others, and therefore it's able to outcompete any other potential species, or whether that was just an area that had a very high density of that one species, we don't have a firm answer for. I think the the best thing to do is to target areas of land management that have known overlapping ranges of species and try and conduct some sort of study for that. It's what we thought we were originally doing by targeting the southeast of Missouri, which has the highest diversity of burrowing crayfish, and we only found that one species. So it was a little bit of an unexpected result, but it's a good question, and it definitely deserves its own study as to how these species are interacting with each other as well as the practices. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, this question from the chat, um, what about the sounds that burrowing crayfish make? Is this known? <laughs> <laughs> um, sounds beyond bubble, 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 bubble when they're really angry at having been caught. I, 
I have never heard another sound come from a burrowing crayfish. I know that the uh the where where the crawdad sing movie and book got really popular, but I haven't heard any singing in my sampling. Oh, what um, kind of sounds did you hear them make? If you don't mind sharing, <laughs> you can turn on your mic if you would like to, or you can put it in the chat. Um, you want to imitate the sounds? <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, there we go. Hey, Chris. Hey, uh Hi, hello from Germany. <clears throat> I kept uh, burrowing crayfish, Cambados diogenes, for a while in the tank, and I observed that there were two. One of them made sounds during the night. I'm not sure which ones, but um, I kept them for a, a longer time, and I heard like something like a grasshopper similar. I have not recorded it, but I should have. So. Um, back then, um, I, I left it there and I said, one day I will pick it up and go in the field and try to record and see about the communication, if they really have these sounds to communicate. So I just want to ask, is this known? Because if you do all these studies about barring crayfish, what about um, going there in the nights and putting microphones to the burrows and see if there is communication happening with sounds? Yeah, I and mean, also, I... I observed that the females dug the, the burrow and the male came through the females out and occupied the burrow. Is this known? Yeah, we have we found cases of a male and a female within a burrow. I've never yeah, heard anything. in the burrow. But have you observed that the males uh, throw out the females of the burrow and the female has to dig another burrow and the male occupied the burrow? Because also this I observed while keeping the, fray, the crayfish, the female always did the work and the male came and threw it out. Is this known? So I haven't done any kind of camera studies that would have captured that kind of information. I, I don't think it's known if crayfish are fighting each other for burrows or if male crayfish are kicking female crayfish out. I've never heard of anything like that, but it's it's definitely possible. We found two crayfish in a burrow at the same time. Um, oh, sometimes yeah. you find crayfish in burrows that seem much larger than they could have dug. So there is kind of a question on burrow sharing or moving between burrows, how much burrow fidelity there is, but I don't have a good answer for you. Did you, did you ever find uh, more generations in a burrow? Like some South American species that I collected in South America, I have found like 27 crayfish on one burrow of two or three generations. Is this known in the area you studied? So I've heard that for the parastachid crayfish. Um, I haven't heard it being very common for the cambarids. I've found one burrow where there was a parent and juveniles that felt maybe older than a year, but it's happened to me once. And I don't really know of a lot of other researchers where they found okay. multiple generations within a burrow. I do know that Zach Graham is interested in that line of thought. So he might have some better answers for you. That could be a very interesting project, uh, mm -hmm. see how many generations, you know, in a burrow and definitely try and record that sound that you're that you're hearing and you can send it over to me and we can uh, try and figure out what's what's happening. So that's actually really interesting. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, yeah, I, at the moment, I work with Papa and uh, crayfish from Papa and Eugenie, so I don't have any cambaros, but I will come over in May to do more recording, filming and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So maybe then I will take some home to study them in a, I, I made up a big aquarium with mud in it really big and put the crayfish in there. And so I could observe and listen this at night. And that is the interesting thing. I will work on that. Thank you very much. Thank yeah, you so thank much. You. Thanks. Great. Um, next question. Would you recommend for land managers to reduce canopy cover around existing crayfish colonies? That's a really interesting question because I think it has implications for other species like white-tailed deer that are of interest that might still want those denser canopies and denser wooded areas to rely on and where you're having species of financial interest those are often prioritized I'd say probably not I, I don't think I would recommend removing trees for crayfish but where you can maintain moist soil open areas that should definitely be prioritized um we did find burrowing crayfish in forested areas. They are able to survive and it's not like a requirement. It seems to be more of a preference. Um, so I'd say don't cut down trees for crayfish. 
but uh but maintaining open areas it does seem to be pretty important for promoting populations on the land and the the conservation areas i was working in are large enough that they can have both so where there's more suitable areas for the crayfish they are congregating there great thank you did you observe any shifts in burrow density for your local disturbance study related to mechanical disturbance even when not observing a crayfish Not sure I understand the question. Sorry. I Shifts in burrow density for so the amount of burrows in an area occupied or not. Maybe you saw. Oh, we have Brooke here. If you would, uh, yeah, uh, they would like to continue. <laughs> yeah. So I was thinking, like, you know, in the context of like burrow density, like, did you observe larger burrow communities, um, in areas where you observed the mechanical disturbance versus not? You know, regardless of whether or not you actually managed to capture an individual. So, so yeah, so we, I probably should have mentioned, we used active burrows as our, as our um, variable that we were testing because the number of crayfish we were actually getting our hands on was so low. So we were measuring change in burrow density. And because we were repeatedly only finding one crayfish when we successfully dug up a burrow, that that's that's the species that we expected to find across all of our sites but we didn't successfully get a crayfish out of every burrow we used the burrow as our uh, variable of interest okay that helps thank you for sure thanks so much Brooke. okay let's see um looking for any more questions um i guess i had one that i'd love for you to answer um sure. do you know of any collaborative effort or any partnerships that have been established to address the the lack of data on burrowing crayfish either in the states or or anywhere really in the world so i don't know if any like official partnerships um there are a small number of labs around the country that work on burrowing crayfish and it's kind of up to those lab pis how much they spend their time sampling for crayfish and that's pretty much the only way we're getting data um here in illinois there uh, there was a project funded for the crustacean collection with dusty swedberg who did a statewide survey for burrowing crayfish but i don't know of a lot of other states that are funding distributional work for burrowing crayfish specifically mm -hmm. could you talk a little bit more about the, like, the potential future research with burrowing crayfish either like if it's an extension from your research or possibly with dusty's or or somebody else's in the area Sure. I mean, I I have a lot of different research arms that I'm very excited. I have too many questions and not enough lifetimes to answer them all. Um, I think some a lot of my other work works on stable isotopes and trying to establish diets and how species are using their resources. So I'm very interested in continuing that kind of work and mapping more distributions and densities of populations, not just in Illinois, but around the United States, and trying to understand basically how crayfish went from largely being aquatic uh, permanent water dwelling species to this terrestrial colonization, why they evolved burrowing behavior. Um, so they're doing doing that via a mix of density and isotopic diet studies while also maintaining this distribution modeling. I think there's a lot of other work with distributional modeling that can be done, looking for umbrella species that we can use to represent larger groups of crayfish. Um, because if we're not able to get enough state agencies or partnerships that are interested in documenting the distributions of every single species we have in the country, at least being able to have some representatives that are well documented would be really useful. Yeah, that's very true. Thank you so much. For sure. Well, if there are, um, oh, we just got one question. Um, I live on a farm and in eight years I've seen many chimneys but never any crayfish. Is there a way to catch them without digging? How far would you have to dig? Um, how far would you have to dig? I mean, crayfish burrows can extend six feet into the ground easily. Um, if you wanted to get to the end, you'd have to dig pretty far, which is partially why our success rates are so low. If you're just wanting to find what is in what is on your farm and you don't care about getting a data set with enough statistical power to analyze, you could try baiting them out. I know people use like shrimp or jerky on a string and put it in a burrow and see if they can get anything to crawl out. 
Also going after it rains, you might find crayfish on the surface, either because the oxygen in their burrow is reduced or because they're trying to catch a snack. Um, so going out at, when it's wet at nighttime, you might have better shot of seeing what's in the burrow. Um, yeah, so baiting them or nighttime when it's wet. I heard hot dogs are also a popular um, bait. People will really just shove anything into the burrow and see if it works. You know, Whatever's the cheapest. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, we have another question. Uh, what is a fishless pond? Are they capturing rainwater or are they developed springs? Are they of significant depth? Yeah, so I mean, they, they are pretty wide. They could be easily 10 to 20 meters across. Um, and I didn't go in. I don't know how deep exactly they are. But um, they they are designed to imitate what would be a natural pothole type pond on the landscape. Um, they are mostly rain fed. And when I say fishless pond, I just mean that there are not fish in them. These are ponds that were installed artificially for amphibian breeding habitat. So they haven't put fish in them that would risk the amphibian eggs. Um, they they are mostly rainwater fed. I don't think these these ones at least weren't developed springs. Got it. Thank you. Well, it seems like we have no other questions in the chat or in the Q&A box. Um, so I guess we will call that the end of the webinar. Thank you again so much, Caitlin, for, for coming out and talking about your work. Um, and uh, thank you for the attendees for coming out. Um, we will be having a webinar next week on Wednesday, um, but I will be posting about that sometime um, in the next couple of days. Thank you. You put the your email in the chat. I see that. So if somebody wants to email you any other questions, I'm assuming they can use that email. Yeah, for sure. All right. Great. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great rest of your day.